Well, welcome. Um, many of you I don't know, so I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Bob Maley. I'm the President Emeritus uh, and a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes and also Professor of Pathology and Medicine at UCSF. So today we're going to talk about the chalk talk, and we will consider together the presentation skills for a job interview in academia, which now almost always involves a chalk talk, maybe always. And I understand now that they're also becoming uh, more common uh, for industry positions. The chalk talks, as I just said, are widely used, and they started about 10 to 15 years ago because we learned that we could really get to know a candidate for a faculty position uh, much better uh, by having them give not only an oral slide presentation, but also a chalk talk. And as you will see and as we will talk about, a chalk talk is simply standing in front of a whiteboard. We don't use chalk now, but the, uh, the felt pens uh, to uh, explain your goals and your aspirations. So what I will discuss with you today uh, will be considered as, as best practices that I and others uh, have learned from being on literally dozens of search committees over the number of years and attending even more dozens uh, of chalk talks. And so I've tried to pull together for you uh, some of the best practices for you to think about and to see how it works for you. So what is a chalk talk? Let's say a little bit more about it and why are chalk talks uh, used so prominently now? Well, they're used by search committees to assess the suitability of a candidate for a job. And there are two levels uh, for this assessment. We'll talk about them. One is at the level of you as a professional. That's your science. That's your goals. That's your aspirations. And the second part of a chalk talk assessment uh, involves uh, more personal characteristics. A chalk talk is an informal format to learn about you as a potential candidate. There are no slides. You simply stand, as I said, in front of a whiteboard and you talk about your aspirations, your goals, your aims. Now, we say it's an informal format, but in fact, a chalk talk is anything but informal. It's not a chat. It is quite an, a formal part of the presentation. A chalk talk follows a formal slide presentation, and there are a couple of different formats in which uh, the uh, assessment of a candidate uh, involves. First of all is the slide presentation, and that may occur uh, on one day followed uh, immediately over a period of a day by the chalk talk. Or, alternatively, you may give an oral presentation, and there may be four or five different candidates, and the search committee assesses those that they want to come back. And when you come back uh, to uh, the, the place where you're being considered, then you give a chalk talk. So it can be either uh, way. Chalk talks are often, and I stress this as one of the most important points of my talk today, most often the most important determinant for getting a job. A chalk talk almost always determines whether you're going to get an offer. To say it in another way, I have commonly seen chalk talks determine who doesn't get the job. A good seminar, yes, we expect that, but a poorly prepared chalk talk will almost always result in a poor uh, outcome for your candidacy. So we call it informal, but please realize it's not informal. Well, what's the length of a typical chalk talk? 
Well, they tend to be 30, 40, or 50 minutes in length. In length. The um, search committee will tell you what they expect uh, of you, and then you gauge how much you can present. Now, one thing that we will talk about is a chalk talk uh, is often interrupted. Slide presentations, you often don't get questions until the very end. But during a chalk talk, you will get questions almost immediately, and you will get them uh, repeatedly. So you have to be sure you know what you want to say and not get flustered when you get interrupted. Now, if you're asked to give a 40-minute chalk talk, how long a talk should you prepare? Well, it should be about 20, 25 minutes, because typically the search committee is going to ask you a large number of questions. Also, when you're preparing for your uh, chalk talk, you need to consider the type of candidate that the organization is looking for. That is, what is the nature of the job search. Now, some job searches are very focused. They're looking for a specific expertise. For example, a few years ago, we had a search here at the Gladstone in which we were looking for a, an electrophysiologist in neurobiology, specifically a mammalian electrophysiology. And so that was a very uh, specific type of a search. Some searches, and another one we did a few years ago, was to cast a net, and we were looking for a geneticist. We really didn't care whether it was mammalian uh, geneticist, a drosophila geneticist, a, 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 a exactly what type of a geneticist uh, that we were looking for. Now, there's a third type of search, and that's a search that, uh, in which there is a, a general, um, even more general net. You're simply looking for the best candidate, and it doesn't matter what the area of expertise is. Now, that sometimes happens in university departments where they're filling out a broad range of expertise. And so they are looking for what they refer to as the best athlete. As long as you're the best, it doesn't matter the topic. And so you really must know. You must know the type of search so that you can prepare uh, the uh, presentation in the right uh, way. And this, the type of search, determines the type of committee, the composition of the search committee. Search committees are usually a mixture of senior and junior investigators. Senior investigators are often interested at the 40,000 foot level. They're interested in how you fit into the institute or to the department, whereas junior investigators are often interested in the details. How did you prepare the sample for mass spectrometry? Those types of questions. And so you, you need to understand that. Often, search committee members have very diverse uh, backgrounds, even in specific searches. When we had our search for an electrophysiology and mammalian biology, uh, there were two or three experts on the committee that were expert in electrophysiology. The others uh, were generalists. And so you have to realize that you're often speaking to a general audience of people that are interested in you, but they may not be expert in the area that you're being considered for. Search committee members are always very busy people, and so you must learn to be efficient in the way you allocate uh, your time. You will know, or you should know, the names of all of the search committee members. A search committee is usually made up of six, eight, 10, I think maximum I've ever seen is 12 uh, people on a search committee. Uh, you need to look them up. Of course, you can find out everything on Google now, and you should know uh, exactly who these people are. You should know them by name. You should know uh, their expertise, uh, and you can always ask your PI or other people that you know if they know these individuals. And so ask 
What type of a person is this individual? So when you go into a search committee uh, and a chalk talk uh, uh, discussion, you really should know everybody that's involved in this process. This will help you a great deal uh, as you meet the, the assessment. So that's the, at the very beginning. What is a chalk talk? The nature of the search, the composition. And I'll stop there to see if there are any questions at this point. And also, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, you're the search committee, so I'm here uh, uh, to, uh, to, to get a job at the Gladstone. So uh, you can interrupt me and ask me any question. Jeremy, you had a question. Um, have you ever heard of a two-hour Oh, I've never heard of a two-hour chalk talk. Is that what they've asked you to do? Uh, two hours. Wow, that is a, uh, a toughie. Um, no, I've never heard more than a 50-minute chalk talk. And we typically here at Gladstone have uh, 45 to 50-minute uh, chalk talks. A two-hour chalk talk I have never heard of. Uh, how would you prepare for a two-hour with much prayer and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to deal with that as we go through and, and the discussion and, and to see what areas uh, you will need to, uh, to enrich and enhance. So a, a two-hour I've never heard of, and, and you have my sympathy. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Did I see another hand? Yes. What is the most way to find out Yes, what's the best way to find out about a job search, the, the nature of the job search? Well, uh, oftentimes uh, there will be a formal ad. In fact, there always has to be now to meet all sorts of regulations. There has to be a formal written job description. So you can find that. If you uh, have not found it, uh, you will have been contacted by someone usually the chair of the search committee, and it's totally appropriate uh, for you to ask uh, for more details about the job so that you can find out if it's specific or general. Uh, and also, and, and I think I already said this, but it's also entirely appropriate for you to know the names of all search committee uh, uh, members. So please do uh, ask them. Hiring the um, correct person for the correct job uh, really determines the success of an organization, whether it's a department or whether uh, it's an institute. The wrong recruitment uh, is painful for everybody involved. It's painful for the employer and it's painful, obviously, for the employee. So the right match the right match is essential, and that's why search committees and departments and deans and so forth work very hard to make sure they find out everything they possibly can about a, a candidate. So let's consider now what are the search committees looking for uh, in a, a candidate. And what I will do in order to uh, help you to try to remember some of this, we'll talk about uh, the four F's. And what we'll be talking about now are those uh, characteristics that define you professionally, define your capability, uh, define how good uh, a scientist uh, you are. And so the first F is actually called focus. The focus of your research is focused or it's diffuse. Now the focus must be realistic. Uh, this is a balancing act. It's got to be big enough focus to excite the search committee members, but not too big because you don't want to be perceived as naive that you can't possibly accomplish uh, what you are uh, uh, setting out to be your focus. For example, and I quote, 
I plan on curing Alzheimer's disease uh, during my first three to five years. Okay, well, good luck. I hope you will, but that's really a naive statement uh, for an entry-level uh, assistant professor, and that's what we're generally talking about. It's much better to say something like, I, I want to contribute to understanding the mechanism and contribute to the cure of Alzheimer's disease. So, so, so be careful, it's, got to, it's a balancing act. It, it's got to be big enough to excite, but not too big that you are perceived as uh, naive. Will you focus short term and diversify long term? This actually is the best way uh, to structure your talk, and, and we'll give some examples. Focus short term, that should be doable. Important, yes, it's got to be important, but it's something that you can accomplish in a relatively short period of time. It's got to be uh, doable. Now, if you're looking at an academic position, you might as well learn the phrase, publish or perish, get funding or fail. And so that's what you are trying uh, to do. And then diversify long term. Diversification long term is risky. And a search committee wants to see you have a bold uh, focus, to have, to, to, to reach, to stretch, uh, to, to have a big idea, to move the marker. So it's a balancing act. Focus is a balancing act. And it's got to be doable, but it's an element of it has got to be risky. As I said, interrupt me at any time. The second F is future. What are your future prospects? Here at Gladstone or here at UCSF, what are you going to accomplish in two or three years? What are you going to accomplish in uh, five years? I'm not interested in a flash in the pan. I want to see a plan that has a hope and a future. I'm investing, as a member of the search committee, I'm investing in a faculty member for the long term. You're going to cost the Gladstone or cost UCSF a lot of money to recruit you because I've got to set up your lab, I've got to make sure that I provide enough resources for you to be successful, so I'm going to make a long-term investment. I'm not interested in hiring someone for two, three, four years. I'm interested in investing uh, for the future of the new faculty. This is what a director, this is what a president, this is what a dean uh, looks for, is an investment uh, for the long term. Now the third professional characteristic is funding. Do you have a track record? Well, it's okay not to have a track record because many of you coming out of a postdoctoral fellowship will not have a funding. Some of you will have a K-99. Some of you may have been on an R01, but you will not have, almost certainly, you will not have uh, your own uh, R01. So what is important is that you have a knowledge of the process. Do you understand the funding uh, mechanisms? Do you understand about the NIH? Do you understand the institutes that make up the NIH? Do you understand about fan foundations and uh, disease-focused organizations? I might ask you as a search committee member, when are you going to apply for your first R01? So, what does that mean? It means you must know what an R01 is, and it means you should have an idea of where you're going to submit that R01. You need to take advantage of your PI or anyone else in your organization, institute, or department to learn to take advantage. If you can have the opportunity to participate in writing a grant, 
Most likely you've written a fellowship. That's great uh, background. But to write a full R01 uh, takes practice and takes some experience. So, uh, so do your best to gain that experience. I'll give you some examples uh, in a few minutes. The fourth F is fun. This begins to bridge over into the personal characteristics. But it's here also under your professional uh, capabilities uh, because I want to know as you stand in front of me, in front of that whiteboard, that you're pleasant, that you have eye contact with the members of the committee, that you're interested in others, that you know who the people are sitting here uh, in the room, uh, that you answer questions well, that you respond uh, nicely. So it, are you someone with whom I would like to interact and interact uh, long term? So now let's go on with what the search committee is looking for, and now let's consider the personal characteristics. And here again, as to help you to try to remember these, I refer to these as the six uh, Ds. The first D is drive. Do you have the drive to be a PI? A PI must have passion and must have uh, enthusiasm. I'm looking for passion in the people that I uh, hire for Gladstone or wherever. Are you committed? When things go wrong, and they will go wrong in the laboratory, how are you going to respond? Are you going to throw in the towel and give up? No, you've got to have passion. Enthusiasm. This is a tough profession. Science is not easy. It is sure fun. It's great. I love it. But there are ups and downs. And so you must have enthusiasm to keep going when things are not working so well. Now, some of us are more introverted than others. And so that means those of us that are introverts have to up our game. We have to work harder to show enthusiasm. But the extrovert, on the other hand, uh, has to learn to tone it down a little bit. Or you can come across as a little bit too confident, uh, too uh, 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 involved in, in what you, you're doing. So you need to listen more. You need to speak less. So you have to fine tune your own personality. Uh, as you uh, demonstrate your drive with passion and enthusiasm. Now in 2012, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize, as you all know, for IPS uh, cells. And he was often asked, he was asked when he presented here at Gladstone, he was asked the same question in Stockholm, he's been asked the same question that I'm about to tell you in just a few uh, seconds. And that is, Dr. Yamanaka, how did you undertake such a difficult project? And it was. It was a difficult project. And his answer was, VW. He always gives that answer all around the world. And what is VW? Well, VW is not a Volkswagen car. VW happens to be a retreat talk that I gave when Shinya was a postdoc uh, here at the Gladstone in the mid-1990s. Uh, and what VW stands for is the secret of scientific success. Oh, that sounds like that should work. Okay, so V, V stands for vision. Where are you going with your career? What is your vision? What are your plans for the future? What are your plans with drive, with passion, and with enthusiasm? Your plans have to be those. Your vision has to be something that stretches you. Some may say it's impossible. Shinya was told numerous times what you're undertaking is impossible. It was risky. It was a dream. And in 
uh, a part of vision is contributing uh, to uh, society as well. That's the V. The W stands for work. You have to work hard to achieve uh, your vision. So this is what Shinya Yamanaka said, that for him to undertake this difficult project, he had to exercise VW. So that's somewhat uh, of, a, of an aside, but I want to emphasize for you that search committees are looking for your drive with passion and enthusiasm. Yes? Yeah, no, uh, when uh, Shinya uh, left the Gladstone in, I think it was 1996, uh, he went back to Japan uh, to, to find a faculty position. He actually went to the university at Nara. Um, and uh, here at uh, Gladstone, he had begun working with uh, embryonic stem cells. And so, yes, he was interested in reprogramming, but he had discovered a factor uh, it's called NAT1. Some of you may know it. Uh, he's gone on to uh, elucidate the function of this particular factor. So he wanted to uh, understand how NAT1 uh, actually uh, editing occurred. Uh, no, I'm sure he did not uh, propose that he would figure out the four uh, factors that would convert skin fibroblasts uh, into embryonic stem cell-like uh, cells. Uh, I'm sure he did not do that. Uh, but uh, that's, of course, what he accomplished. Any other uh, questions before we go on? Okay. The second D is determination. Can you stick up for yourself? Some committee members, it's not common, but once in a while I've been on a committee where one of the committee members feels that it is his or her role uh, to challenge you, uh, to see how you actually stand up for yourself and uh, defend yourself. A committee member that I recall once uh, said, um, I'm not so sure, Dr. Jones, uh, that this is the best approach. I actually know that that person actually didn't know what the best approach was, but uh, he asked this question uh, of uh, the candidate. So how do you how do you respond to what is perceived as as criticism? Well, this is something you have to work at a as well. And so you can say something like, uh, I, "I appreciate the question very much, um, but." Uh, Jones et al. in 2006 demonstrated such and such, and my preliminary data, which is not complete yet, but my preliminary data does suggest that the approach that I have started to lay out for you uh, has the potential uh, to, to be successful, but I would really be quite happy uh, to learn more of, of your thoughts. Now, depending upon uh, how passionate the questioner was, he may, and they usually do, drop it at that point. Or they say something like, well, when we meet uh, later today or tomorrow, uh, let's talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but they can push you, and, and, and you'll need to be ready uh, to stand up for yourself, to stick up uh, for your approach. Not arrogance. Arrogance does not work. Arrogance will work only against you. So modesty, um, I appreciate the question. I understand your concern. Uh, all of those sorts of phrases have to be on the tip of your tongue. Third personal characteristic is uh, demeanor. Are you a colleague to be proud of? Do you act like a professional? What's your level of social maturity? I'm interested, as a faculty member, as a search committee member, I'm interested in being associated with true professionals, professionals at every level. 
So your demeanor means a lot. Smile, interest, eye contact, and so forth. Fourth, dialogue. Are you able to communicate your science, your goals, your aspirations? You are standing in front of a whiteboard with a felt marker or two. That's all you've got. Now, can you communicate? Can, and, and as I'll say in a minute, this all depends upon how much you practice. But can you communicate to the search committee? Do you have an elevator speech? <clears throat> Do you have a summary of your research that you can tell in one, two, three, four, five minutes? The time it takes an elevator to go a couple of floors. Have you developed good oral presentation skills? Have you worked at that? Now, I often tell young scientists that 50% of your success depends upon the excellence of your scientific data. That's a fact, no, no question about it. But the other 50% of your success as a scientist depends upon your ability to present your science. Orally, slide presentations, standing up, elevator talks, so forth. Dialogue. And dialogue means sharing your aspirations in a setting where you exchange information with those in the audience. The next is dress. Do you look like a professional? Now, I would have guessed that most of you have figured out that I'm fairly conservative. And if you guess that, you're right. Um, I've worn a tie every day that I have ever been in the Gladstone Institute, and actually before. Now, I'm not so good at describing what women should wear to uh, participate in a chalk talk, but I can tell you what a man should wear, and you can decide for yourself the women, uh, what your attire should be. The men should wear a tie. And I think they should wear a sport coat. Uh, now, that's really true if you're interviewing. Jeremy, where are you interviewing? In, in Chicago. Oh, that's, <clears throat> that's uh, east of the Rockies. Anything east of the Rockies, a tie and a sport coat, OK? East of the Rockies. California, this, I don't know. California's a little screwed up in this way. But uh, so you're east of the Rockies, you wear a tie and a sport coat. Now, if no one else has a sport coat, well, you take it off, throw it over your arm. What's the big deal? You're not going to offend anybody by wearing a, a tie. Uh, that's for sure. We had a candidate here. None of you know this person, so I'll tell the story. Uh, here a few years ago looking for a job in the Cardiovascular Institute. Um, and he, he presented his slide presentation, really, really interesting things. What did he wear? He wore a T-shirt. Well, it was a white T-shirt, so I guess that was what he thought was elevated, the T-shirt. But uh, the tail was hanging out. He didn't get the job. He didn't look like a professional. I, I didn't actually want him at Gladstone, uh, and he's not. Um, as I've already said, faculty members are interested in having people that they can be proud of uh, and that uh, are professional. Now, the last of the characteristics, personal characteristics, is the dinner. There's usually a dinner associated with the recruitment, almost always, as far as I know. But this is not a social affair. This is part of your interview. This is not a time to relax, kick back. This is still part of the process. I almost always can tell by the end of the dinner, whether I'm going to be in favor of hiring a person or not. I heard the oral presentation. I heard the chalk talk. I had 30 minutes with them. I had 
an hour and a half or two hour dinner, I know whether I want them on the faculty or not. That's as far as I need to go. So the dinner is the, the capper. This is a good time for you to engage the faculty members. So you should know who's going to the dinner. That's a perfectly reasonable question to ask the chair of the committee. So you know who's going to be there. There may be only four, five. That's, it's usually a little smaller. And this is a good time for you to show interest in them and to ask questions. What is your advice for a uh, young scientist in choosing their first faculty appointment? A question like that. How did you decide to come to UCSF? In your career, uh, what mistakes did you make as a young scientist? So, so this does several things. One, it takes a little bit of the heat off of you because you've had a full day. But more importantly, it shows that you're interested in these people. And this has to be genuine. And I'm not ta talking about making up things. I'm, I'm talking about showing a general uh, interest in the people with whom you hopefully, assuming you want the job, uh, hopefully you will become colleagues uh, with. So you want to know them uh, because, as I'll say in a, in a few minutes, this is a two-way process. You're trying to determine whether to accept the job if you get an offer. So this is a two-way deal. So you, you need to have an interchange, even a dialogue with these individuals, which can go on uh, at dinner. And no alcohol. Uh, as, as I said, this is part of the interview process. Um, obviously, if they go around and pour wine at the table, uh, of course, uh, why not? But be careful. Um, uh, once in a while, a little too much alcohol uh, is not a good thing. Uh, for a, a recruitment. All right. The professional ability, capabilities, and the personal characteristics. Questions about any of these issues. In fact, you may disagree with some of them. That's fine. Yes, please. Yeah, well, the, um, in my experience, you may have a different experience, but in my experience, um, the first thing that usually happens when a candidate goes to an organization, an institute, a department, uh, to interview for a position, uh, the search committee wants to know the general uh, topic. And so the slide presentation almost always comes first. Now, maybe there are exceptions. Um, if, if you have the dinner before they really know very much about you except what your CV shows, um, I think you can do exactly the same thing. In fact, maybe it's even more important uh, to, uh, to want to get to know the members of the search committee. For one thing, if you have that opportunity, it might make the relationship go easier uh, when you have uh, the, the chalk talk. Uh, so I, I, th I think it could work either way. Typically, the way I described it is the typical way, though. Yes. Uh, your personal life, um, we're not in, we haven't emphasized here. That's the nature of the question from Jeremy. Uh, it, it, that will all come out at the dinner uh, because uh, search committee members are going to want uh, to, know, uh, to know you personally. Um, and, and they will ask you uh, personal, reasonable personal uh, questions. They, they want to, to know... Um, where you were raised, those are always easy questions. Um, uh, where's your family? Um, 
if they don't know whether you're married or not, they'll figure out some way to ask you that, because they can't ask you. Uh, but they'll figure that out. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll find out in, in talking uh, to you. There are various ways that you can figure out uh, almost the answers to any question you want to ask that are not legal to ask. So, okay. All right. Okay, so let's go on. Let's talk about the do's and the don'ts of a chalk talk. Don't repeat your seminar. As we'll say in just a few minutes, give enough background so they can understand your aims, your goals, your aspirations for the future. But do not repeat your seminar. For one thing, you won't have time. Jeremy will. He's got two hours. But typically, you will only have 40 to 50 minutes. That's, I've never heard of two hours, but that's all right. So uh, Jeremy can tell him all sorts of things that he gave in his seminar. Most of you will not be able to. You're going to have to summarize a 45-minute seminar in five to 10 minutes. So that's giving enough background. <clears throat> Don't use uh, slides. Don't use slides. Uh, we once had a candidate a few years ago um, who came uh, to be interviewed for a position. He showed up in the conference room to meet the search committee for his chalk talk, and he said, well, I'd like to start with a few slides. Well, the chairman of the committee said, uh, no, we, we don't use slides. Uh, this, this really is a, is a chalk talk. I'm sorry if we didn't make that plain, but uh, 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 really, we don't want slides. Well, this candidate was in real trouble because he or she, I won't indicate that, uh, he or she was not prepared to give a chalk talk. He or she was actually going to repeat part of the seminar. That's not what this is all about. Don't turn your back on the audience excessively. Now, you're going to write on the board, so you have to turn your back to a certain extent. Uh, that's, most of us can't write uh, still facing uh, the audience. So uh, you, will, you will turn your back, but do not do it excessively. Occasionally, there is a candidate that actually talks to the board the entire time. And, and, it, and eye contact and this personal interaction. This is the personal uh, side that you're trying to get across. And don't get flustered by being interrupted. This is not your agenda. This is the agenda of the search committee. They have heard your seminar, slide presentation. They've read your CV. <coughs> they have questions that they want to ask you, but they also want to know where you're going with the research that you uh, presented. So you're going to have to go with the flow. Don't get flustered. Don't get irritated. You've got all these things you want to say, but you may not get to say uh, um, everything that you, that you want to say. So now the do's. Do build on the seminar. And you're going to build on it by telling where the science is going to go. You know, many times in an oral presentation, slide presentation, you'll have future aims or future studies. So that's kind of where you're, you are here. You, you've, but you only have one slide on that in a 45-minute talk. You, haven't, you don't have time to go into all your future work, nor should you. The slide presentation is to present what you have done. The chalk talk is to present what you're going to do. So that's the difference. Do keep it simple. Those of you that have, took my, have taken my art of lecturing know that we talk about the KISS principle. Keep it simple. As simple as you can make it, complete, not watered down, but simple as you can, the better. You're, in your chalk talk, you're going to list the aims, the goals. Usually you'll have two or three, usually three goals, and you're going to have a plan of 
two, three, four, five, maybe six, seven years. That's the way you're going to lay out your goals. Demonstrate knowledge of search committee members' expertise and refer to them if possible and natural. That means, as I already said, you've got to know the search committee members. So when you're presenting, and I'll give you examples. This will make more sense probably when I give an example in, in, in a demonstration talk that I'm going to give in a few minutes. It, it'll become clearer how you might refer to the committee members, an expertise that they know, a method that they know, uh, something that you need uh, uh, help with. Okay. Try to lead the discussion. <clears throat> As I said, it's not your agenda, so it's hard for you to lead, but you need to develop some ways of steering the search committee's questions so that they don't eat up all the time and you don't get to get to your third and fourth point uh, in your presentation. So if it's correct that you think the question that someone just asked will become clear as you present, then say that. I believe that it will become clear as I continue to present, but, but please ask me again if, if I'm wrong and if I have not answered your question. Or <coughs> if, if it's a difficult question, say something like, well, that's a valid point, but may I suggest that you know, preliminary data, references, literature, something, may I suggest that, uh, that the approach that I'm uh, taking uh, has, has merit. And so you're going to want to be able to deflect the discussion as much as you can but it's not your agenda. Indicate <clears throat> agreement with your PI uh, about the future. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> many of you um, come from big labs. That means the PI has a, a number of postdoctoral fellows or students, and that often means that a project that you were involved in, that you led, that's really your project, will be picked up by another postdoc or another student that's coming behind you. Sometimes you can work out with the PI that this, that will not occur, but oftentimes it's a continuum within the PI's lab. And search committee members often know your PI, and they know what their research goals are. And if you present exactly the same research goal that they know the PI is, is following, uh, then that's a problem. Because <coughs> entry-level assistant professors uh, honestly can't compete. Now, and that's, that's a fact. Right or wrong, I'm not saying, but it, it's a fact. Dr. So-and-so actually has a million dollars in grants. You have 200000 you can't compete. So work it out with your PI and be able to say it uh, during your presentation. Demonstrate enthusiasm about being considered uh, by, <clears throat> by the organization. I'm really pleased to be here today uh, uh, to be considered by the Gladstone Institutes and I thank you for this opportunity. It's very easy to say. It has to be honest and it has to be uh, truthful, but you need to say something like that. So now let's go on to consider tips uh, for uh, success. Here again, the most, uh, yes, there are two hands, so I'll stop before I start this. Yes. Yeah, if, if you've got uh, two experts and four generalists, um, uh, how do you pitch your discussion? You pitch to the whole group. That one vote per person. So you, you want six votes in your favor. Um, you don't usually vote, so let, let me not mislead you. 
it's usually a general discussion and a, a consensus is developed. B but you want everybody to have a positive comment about you and about uh, the work that you're doing. So you have to pitch it to both. Now that often means that you have to answer the technical question at the same time you say, um, now let me, uh, let me emphasize that um, this has uh, implications in, in something. It, so I'm not giving a good example, sorry about that. But, but you, have to, you have to balance your response so you don't exclude the four non-experts. So you, you're going to have to to work that out. That was another hand. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so the question is. She has assumed that the search committee members all attended the oral presentation. It's not correct. Um, th these eight or ten people are all very busy. To, to coordinate calendars is close to impossible. So almost always someone on the search committee has not attended your slide presentation. And that's a pity. That's too bad. Um, because that's what you've got to do in the background. You have got to give that one, two, or three people enough information that they can understand your aims and your aspirations. That, that's, that's the tough part. We'll say more about that as, as we continue the discussion. OK. <clears throat> Tips for success that um, may be uh, helpful to you. Actually, the most important thing that I can say today is when you are asked to give a chalk talk, practice, and then practice, and then practice again. And practice on one of those occasions with a knowledgeable colleague who will honestly give you feedback. And, and you'll only get honest feedback if you give them permission uh, to do that. You, the last thing you want to hear is, oh, that was great, when in fact it wasn't uh, great. So you really do need to practice, 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 and practice with a colleague. It's much more difficult to give a chalk talk than a slide presentation, much more difficult. Oh, when I started teaching this 10 or 12 years ago, I'd never given a chalk talk. Oh, it was painful for me to give a chalk talk. I thought that was really one of the, t I'm glad that I was well past the chalk talk giving phase, except I've had to learn how to give chalk talks in order to teach how to give chalk talks. So it's not easy. It's not an informal chat. It is a highly structured, presentation without slides. Another, bring your own pens. Don't trust the organization to have felt markers that'll work. There's nothing worse than standing up to start writing and uh, it doesn't work. You, you don't want any uh, disruptions. <clears throat> Plan out the use of the board. Draw it out on a sheet of paper. So. The talk I'm going to, to give you in a few minutes, not exactly using the, the board because I can't, but it's, it's all drawn out here. You probably can't see it. That's all right. But, and, and I'm actually going to hold this piece of paper as I'm talking to you so that I have uh, some clues as to what I, I want to say. Those of you that have taken my art of lecturing, either the short course or the long course, know I'm a nervous, anxious presenter. So this is my... Uh, 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 thing to hang on to uh, so that I don't get uh, flustered. But draw it out on a piece of paper. Know what you're going to put on the board and, uh, um, and then follow that. Okay. Try to arrange 
two to five minutes to put something on the board as the, kid, the committee is assembling. Oftentimes, for us at least at Gladstone, the chalk talks over lunch. So everybody's assembling, they're getting their lunch. You're not going to get any. <laughs> you're the chalk talk presenter, you're not going to get any lunch. But it, so while they're getting their lunch, you can ask the chairperson, uh, is it all right if I put a little something on the board? And of course, they always say yes. And, and it's a good practice uh, to do so. Now, what do you put on the board? Well, we'll go into what uh, a suggestion that I'll make to you, but they include your aims for the future. You may be able to draw a model or a diagram uh, to build on. A few years ago, we had a, a, a person in the Cardiovascular Institute. She was a fantastic artist in addition to a scientist, and she drew a beautiful heart on the board. And then, as she gave her talk, she drew an arrow from the um, uh, patent ductus arteriosus and, and then wrote out the, the transcription factors that were important in that uh, congenital heart disease. So if you can do something like that, fine. Um, it, it's difficult. Uh, or you can <clears throat> put a table on the board. <clears throat> Don't fill in the whole table. Just fill in the, you know, the top, the side, and the bottom. Uh, at, with what you want to talk about and then fill in the table as you give the talk. So that's worked and I've seen that work uh, quite well. You use the board from left to right, from top to bottom, uh, just as you use a piece of paper and be sure to write large. There's nothing more frustrating for a search committee member than to sit at the back of the room. The rooms are usually small conference rooms. but People can write small enough so you can't read it. So, so don't do that. Write large. Plan the use of the board so you don't write too much. You just write enough and you write big. Don't write sentences. That takes too long uh, and it's not necessary. Use phrases or single words or uh, 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 an artist um, uh, diagram or something. Okay, now let's get more specific about the structure of a, a chalk talk. And these are, uh, are my uh, suggestions for you to consider. There are three components that I think uh, each chalk talk uh, should contain. The first of all is the background. We've already mentioned that. Second is uh, a list of the specific aims. And third is some representation of funding that you're going to uh, acquire. So let's begin with the, the background. Let me uh, remind you uh, in the background to give just enough information so if, you, if the one or two of the search committee members did not attend your lecture, they still can understand your specific aims. This is a problem, but it is a common problem. You simply must do it. <clears throat> You've got to give enough in the background to excite the committee. And as I've already said, and we've said a couple of times, they may not have all attended the oral presentation. Remember, they're busy. Some will not get there. Some actually will not be able to make it to the chalk talk. So that's a, it's, it's difficult, but those are just uh, facts. So the background. The second component are the specific aims. You usually use three specific aims. This is similar to the way you envision an R01 grant. That's rather typical. The scope of an R01 grant, because it's funding for either three or five years, is two to three years, things that are doable. Can't all be risky. Can't all be risky. Publish or perish, get funding or fail. But five years, I want to see some risk. I want to see a stretch. I want to see you have a real uh, vision. Third is funding. Like it or not, in an academic appoint appointment, you ultimately will have to fund your own salary to a certain extent at least, and your own uh, lab operations. Timeline, 
I suggest that you have a plan for five years. Uh, how are you going to undertake those three aims? Most of the time, you can't undertake all three aims at the same time. For one thing, you won't have enough uh, manpower uh, to do it in your lab, uh, and so you will have to phase things. I want to know the timing of how you're going to do that. I want to know the type of funding, and we've already said this. You need to know what types of funding uh, you want. Okay, the three components. I'll stop there and, and ask for questions again. Are there any questions about how the structure, this will become clearer as, as we uh, actually look at a demonstration uh, chalk talk. Yes, question. Well, um, I bring it into the to the presentation. Um, I, no one has any objection to a, a, a single piece of paper. Um, I have never, and I would guess maybe 25, 30 percent of people that give chalk talks have something that's either on the table in front of them or that they're holding in their hand. So I don't think there's any problem at all uh, with that. But on that piece of paper, you know what you were going to, to draw on the board in those uh, two or three minutes before everybody starts. And on the piece of paper, you're going to have what you're going to write uh, on the board. Uh, Two-thirds of people don't use anything. Uh, they're better at that than uh, than some others. I don't think it makes one bit of difference. I, truthfully, I like to see <laughs> that you thought about what you were going to, uh, to tell me as a search committee member. So honestly, I see it as a little bit of a plus, but it's not necessary. Okay? Now, okay, so before I give you the demonstration and illustrate the background and so forth, I want to bring this up. Job considerations from your perspective. These are not my ideas, actually. Uh, one of the uh, postdocs uh, here at uh, Gladstone uh, was uh, looking at, uh, at a job search, uh, several job searches. Uh, and he came back and presented uh, to us uh, what uh, he had learned and emphasized something that I think is very important, and that is they're not only interviewing you, but you're interviewing them because you want to know, are the people on the search committee and the others in the department, are they good colleagues with whom you want to work? Are there red flags? Is there someone in that department that's jealous of you or wants to compete with you? Uh, you don't want a position like that. It, I, uh, is the chair of the department not providing enough resources? Is he kind of stingy? Does he expect you to suffer a little bit? I mean, these are red flags. You don't want that. Is this a place you'll be happy to live for five to 10 years? You don't want to move. Um, once you take up a faculty position, you don't want to move, it's usually 10 years. Seven to 10 years is, is common as if people are going to move. So. Are you going to be happy in living in Pittsburgh? Or, uh, I actually like Pittsburgh, so that wasn't a negative comment. But do you want to live in, in, in San Francisco? Um, uh, wh what about if you have a family? What about the kids? Um, where can you afford to live? You know, those are things you need to consider. Are they providing you with what you need to be successful? That's their goal. Their goal is to make sure that you succeed, not to hire you and let you flounder. That's a waste of resources. That's a waste of Gladstone money. I want you to come here and be phenomenally successful. That means I have to provide you finances. I have to make sure there are core facilities that will be available to you, that you will mentor and help me as a young, struggling assistant professor. 
and that it's an intellectual environment that, with people that want to exchange information. Will you have room to grow? And then this uh, individual summed up his talk. These are actually from his slides, so I'm quoting him exactly. His name's Elfege. Some of you will know Elfege. And his final phrase or uh, statement was, collegiality trumps prestige and finances. Well, I hope you have the freedom uh, to be um, uh, really selective and to be picky in what you uh, choose. But you really should, because five to 10 years is a long time in a person's life, and you want to be in a situation that's successful. Now let me illustrate <coughs> some elements uh, of a chalk talk by giving you components uh, of a demonstration uh, chalk talk. Now usually a, a chalk talk, as we've already said, goes on in a small conference room. There are six, eight, ten people at the most. There is a chalkboard. You don't know the size of the chalkboard. I forgot to mention that. As you make your plans, sometimes they're small and sometimes they're large, like the size of the screen. Well, then you're very fortunate because you can you have all the flexibility in the world. But you're going to have to have two plans. One plan for a small board, and the, the easiest plan, the plan for a big board. So since this is a large room, and I've now uh, giving uh, these sorts of, of talks on chalk talks in uh, larger groups, I've had to develop a way uh, to illustrate for you what is, uh, uh, goes on in a, in a chalk talk, and so I won't be writing on the board. I'll be using a series of slides in which I flash what I would have uh, written. It's not the best way, but it's the only way I can do it in groups like this. So this is what I put on the board. This is the two to three minutes in advance of the search committee getting down to business. I put something like this uh, on uh, the board. It's really an outline for me, so I can know where I'm headed, where I, so I can be efficient in what I want to present. I've thought this out very, very carefully. I know precisely what I want to put on all parts of this board. Now, I may have to erase to go through the three, but hopefully I can put all of this, but it's got to be large enough uh, to read. And so this this represents the three components to a chalk talk. This is background. This represents the aims, and this is my funding. Now I'm going to use black to put on to put on the board. Everything I write is just going to be in red. So when you see red, that means I wrote it uh, on the board. I, I like to keep it simple. Some people like to use three or four different colors. If you can, okay, I don't see much purpose to it. If, um, why? Uh, two or three colors, that's, that's enough. Unless you've got a graph with several curves. Then, of course, a different color curve, that's fine. Uh, but usually, kiss. Keep it simple. But also, this helps me to remember, and I probably already said it, where I'm going and what I want to cover. So, here we go. Well, thank you for inviting me back uh, to the Gladstone Institutes. Um, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to uh, share with you what I hope to accomplish in the next uh, three to five years as I establish my own independent uh, laboratory. Now, as you uh, may recall from my seminar, my postdoctoral uh, training focused on the role, and I'm pointing to this now because I'm standing in front of the board. I'm pointing to this. My postdoc focused on the role of APOE, and specifically APOE4 in neuropathology. Our first clue as to how APOE was involved in neuropathology uh, came from understanding the structural differences that distinguish the major uh, isoforms. And let me remind you that there are two major isoforms, 
underline ApoE3, underline ApoE4 to have their attention now on where I am talking uh, on the board. ApoE3 is the most common isoform. I'm writing common. I think you get the, the drift of what I'm trying to do now. ApoE3 is the most common form. However, ApoE4 is not rare. I wrote that out. It occurs in 25% of individuals in the world population. And ApoE4 is important in the pathogenesis, I'm writing this, Alzheimer's disease, and traumatic brain uh, injury. For example, in Alzheimer's uh, disease, ApoE4 is the major genetic risk factor. And if you look at all patients with Alzheimer's disease, 65 to 80 percent of them have this abnormal form of ApoE called ApoE4. ApoE3 and ApoE4 differ by single amino acid interchanges. Now I'm writing, ApoE3 has cysteine at residue 112. ApoE4 has an arginine at this site. This interchange of this single amino acid has a profound effect on the structure and the function of ApoE4. ApoE4 has a unique structure. It's actually an abnormal structure in which arginine 61, the side chain of arginine 61, interacts with glutamic acid 255 in the carboxy uh, terminal domain. ApoE3 has cysteine, as I said, at this site. And in this case, the side chain of arginine 61 is tucked into the four helical amino terminal bundle, so it's less available to interact with glutamic acid 255. And with arginine here, that side chain extends away and this ionic interaction called domain interaction uh, can occur. And this is an abnormal structure for ApoE. Now when ApoE4 is synthesized by neurons, I'm drawing this arrow now, it undergoes neuron-specific proteolysis, generating a series of neurotoxic fragments. These fragments enter the cytosol, and one of the major effects that the fragments have are to interact with the mitochondria and to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. You may recall from the preliminary data that I presented in my slide presentation that if we block domain interaction in ApoE4 using a small molecule called a structure corrector, we can, in fact, convert ApoE4's abnormal structure to a structure resembling the normal form, uh, ApoE3. Uh, now, I've identified a series of small molecules that have the ability uh, to um, interact with E4 and cause this structure uh, correction. I'll say more about that when I discuss uh, my specific aims. So, that's the background. That's what I figured you needed to know if you hadn't attended my seminar that you needed to know in order to understand what I'm going to lay out as my three uh, specific aims. How long do I have to do this? <coughs> well, it depends but uh, on how complex the topic is. But you usually have four or five minutes to give that background. I probably could give that in, in, in less than five minutes, and I consider You'll have to determine for yourself if I give you enough information. But I've determined for myself that this is enough information for you to understand my uh, specific aims. What else should I say about the background? There was something else I was going to say, and I forgot. So um, the, the, the background is critically important. You must not just launch into your specific aims. Almost always, that does not, uh, uh, does not uh, work. Okay, let's go on now. I'm back to the presentation. So 
Let me now consider with you the uh, specific aims of the research that I want to conduct uh, here at the Gladstone Institutes if I'm given the opportunity uh, to join uh, your faculty, and I will conduct these specific aims over the next three to five years. There are actually several steps, and I'm pointing with my marker. There's actually several steps in this pathway that uh, needs to be fully elucidated if we're really to understand uh, the role of APOE4 in neuropathology. And that is the major goal of my lab, to contribute uh, to understanding that role. The first step involves the uh, uh, abnormal uh, structure relates to the, I'm sorry, let me back up. The first step, I'm in my aims now. Did I cover everything here? Yes, so I'm, I'm in the, the first aim now. I'm drawing your attention to uh, the fact that the abnormal structure of uh, APOE4 is important in this pathogenesis, and the question that I am asking is, can we correct the abnormal structure of APOE4 and in so doing uh, prevent the neuropathology using small molecules called structure correctors? The data that I uh, presented in my seminar referred to a small molecule called uh, PY101. And most of the data that I presented in that uh, slide presentation uh, presented work with this small molecule, and they were in vitro uh, studies. Now I want to focus my attention on in vivo effects of the structure correctors. And in so doing, I am going to use ApoE3 and ApoE4 uh, transgenic mice. Now, I'm very fortunate because uh, my mentor, Dr. Huang, uh, has agreed to provide me uh, two breeding pairs uh, of these uh, transgenic mice that are in uh, his laboratory, and this will allow me to have a quick start uh, as I set up uh, my own research. I have identified three distinct uh, chemical series as structure correctors. These structure correctors are actually pyrazolines, pyrazoles, and sulfonamides. And these new uh, compounds, <coughs> as compared to the compound I presented in my uh, original uh, uh, work, uh, have several advantages. For example, they are uh, highly active at nanomolar concentrations, and they penetrate the blood-brain bar barrier very well. My pilot studies have used interperitoneal uh, injections, but I know ultimately I'm going to want to deliver these small molecule structure correctors uh, orally. And so I will develop the uh, oral gavage administration method. And to do so, I have to develop a oral formulation for these compounds. I know that these compounds are highly lipophilic, and so their solubility uh, is a problem. But I now have, in addition to the appropriate detergent, I have now figured out that if I o add the fatty acid, o oleic acid, uh, that I can, in fact, solubilize and deliver uh, these uh, compounds. I, I'm perfectly uh, willing to go into more detail about the, the formulation if this uh, is of interest uh, to the search committee. And hopefully, if I uh, am uh, successful in coming to the Gladstone, I know that Dr. Uh, Sheng Ding uh, here at the Gladstone uh, has a lot of expertise on formulation of small molecules for delivery uh, to animals, uh, and I will uh, take advantage uh, of being able to interact uh, with him at the Gladstone. The readouts that I will use uh, to characterize the effects of these uh, structure correctors will include both histochemistry and behavioral uh, biology. For histochemistry, I will use synaptophysin and MAP2 uh, to determine if, in fact, we are protecting uh, the mouse from the detrimental effects uh, of ApoE4. 
Recall, if you will, from my uh, slides uh, demonstration that the E4 uh, causes uh, a marked loss in uh, uh, synaptophysin staining, especially in the hippocampus. I'll also use the uh, Morris water maze to analyze the uh, memory and learning uh, potential of these mice, treated and untreated with these structure uh, correctors. I've done a lot of water maze uh, work already uh, during my uh, postdoctoral training. Um, and I showed you that APOE4, I, I know, causes uh, memory and learning uh, impairment in the mice. The last time I was here, I actually had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Zhu, uh, who uh, runs the Behavioral Biology Corps, uh, and I've discussed with her the possibility of using that core uh, for my studies. Now, the second step in this pathway uh, involves uh, studies of the protease. The protease is involved in generating these neurotoxic fragments that cause the mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. Now, this work is going on in my previous lab, and I know my, this is a major focus of my mentor's work. Uh, he is actually going to um, elucidate the nature of the protease and define it uh, in, entire, in its entirety. Now, I will uh, profit greatly from staying in contact uh, with him so that I know how this uh, work uh, uh, proceeds, but I'm actually not going to work uh, on the protease uh, myself. What I will do is focus on the identification of the fragments. I'm going to characterize the fragments that the protease uh, generates. I will determine the nature of the uh, cut and uh, by the protease, and I will determine uh, the sequence of those fragments. There are six or seven fragments. We really don't know the structure of those fragments. Uh, they range in size from a molecular weight to, of 12 kD to 29 uh, kD. Uh, and we know that these are the fragments associated with neurotoxicity, but we don't actually know the precise uh, amino acid sequence of each of the fragments. And so that's what I'm going to do. And then with those, that understanding, I will try to determine uh, how those fragments interact with the mitochondria. I'll isolate those uh, fragments from uh, transgenic E4 mouse brains and then I will characterize the fragments by mass spectrometry. Uh, I spent the last six months actually working with Dr. Um, uh, Jones uh, at wherever I was before, uh, Harvard, um, uh, so that I have the technique down and I have the isolation procedure, and I'm very glad, of course, to see that there is a mass spec uh, core here at the Gladstone. As an aside now, there's much more detail that I could go into. <clears throat> it depends on the nature of the search committee. Is it enough simply to say I'm going to do mass spec? Do I need to give more information for the expert to understand? This is an important part of my aim. It's very important for me to understand what these fragments are. So how much detail do I have to give? Um, and, and that you have to work out by knowing the committee or waiting for the questions, because you could now uh, ask me, uh, are you sure you're going to be able to isolate enough uh, from the brain of an APOE4 transgenic mouse? Well, I have preliminary studies that demonstrate uh, that for mass spec I need very little material and that the sample is adequate. So that's the way uh, it will, will play out. So now the third step, back to the talk, the third step uh, in the pathway involves understanding how APOE4 and its fragments alter mitochondrial metabolism. I'm very excited about this because um, it's becoming obvious in the area of Alzheimer's disease especially that metabolic dysfunction and especially mitochondrial dysfunction is an important characteristic of Alzheimer's disease and especially of neuronal changes that we see in Alzheimer's disease. 
I have shown in my slide presentation that at least the large fragment I know interacts with uh, mitochondria. Now I want to extend that work to determine how the fragments interact with the mitochondria and how they cause dysfunction. We've done some preliminary work using the seahorse, measuring uh, respiration and ATP production, but we're going to need to do much more to understand uh, the, the activity uh, going on uh, here with respect to ApoE4. Another major goal of this will, work will be to determine which of the fragments actually interact with the mitochondria. I know, as I said in my seminar, the large one does, but what about the other five or six fragments that are generated? Do any of them interact? And do, what do they interact with? Preliminary data that I have, unpublished data, suggests that the fragments interact with VDAC1, which is the voltage-dependent anion uh, channel that's a major protein on the surface of mitochondria. Now, I'm also going to use uh, proximal ligation assay to really localize <coughs> the fragments uh, to see which proteins they actually interact with. And finally, I will use these most potent structure correctors that I identify up here in my aims uh, to see if we can rescue the mitochondrial dysfunction. <coughs> so that's the aims in a, in a general, uh, in, a, in a quick way. You would give more detail. This will take, you should plan this 40 minute talk. This should be 15 to 20 minutes. You may not get through all of these. You may not be able to complete this whole discussion. It depends upon how much interest I generate in specific topics and how much detail the search committee wants. Now, also, there's a timeline down here. And so I, I want to, to then, uh, if I have time, I hope I will, I now want to uh, show you what this timeline uh, means. Initially, I'm going to focus on <coughs> the first of the specific aims, and that is looking at the uh, effects of the structure correctors uh, in the transgenic mice. This is the aim that's the furthest along with the most preliminary data. And with the startup package that the search committee uh, chair has already told me will be provided, uh, I can hire a research associate and hopefully uh, a summer student uh, to help us. But I will, uh, as soon as possible, continue my work on mitochondrial uh, metabolism uh, to really understand how E4 and maybe uh, the effects of the structure corrector on the mitochondrial metabolism. As soon as I have some additional uh, data in the mice, I'm going to apply for a Alzheimer's uh, Drug Discovery Foundation grant. This will provide me $125,000 over two years and will allow me to hire uh, a postdoctoral fellow, which will certainly help to advance uh, the work. Now, although I'm going to focus initially on the, the structure corrector work, I will begin uh, as soon as possible, as I've said, uh, look at the mitochondrial metabolism. And this will allow me then, hopefully by the beginning of my second year, um, uh, to apply uh, to the NIH for an R01. And I will apply to the National Institute of Aging uh, for that uh, funding. Longer term now, and what I'm really excited about is the possibility that I can continue this work and study traumatic brain injury. We already know that ApoE4 uh, expression in uh, humans undergoing or having traumatic brain injury, we know that they have poor clinical outcomes. And so I want to understand how ApoE4 uh, impacts traumatic brain injury. And as I develop data on that topic, I've, uh, I've already looked at the methodology uh, using cortical impact method in mice in order to study 
a traumatic brain injury, then I will be able to apply to the uh, Defense Department, uh, which has adequate funding in this area because of its importance uh, for the military. So that's an outline and try to demonstrate the components uh, to you. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you may not get that far um, through the whole thing. Um, but don't be flustered. Don't be uh, upset uh, because you will have engendered uh, enthusiasm along the way. Now, I'm often asked, well, why do I, if I don't think I'm going to he get here, why do I put this line here? And why do I write five years? Well, that's simply sending a message uh, to the search committee. I have a plan, and it's a five-year plan. You don't know any of the details. Uh, and, and if I don't get there, um, you can say, as you summarize uh, what, uh, what's going on, you can say, um, I, I, I would really look forward to talking to some of you about how I can fund this project over the five years and, and my plans for that funding. Now, oftentimes, the chair of the committee, when it, the time's up, and it, and it ends promptly uh, because people have planned on being there for a certain period of time, search committee members. So the, the chair will almost always say, uh, Dr. Maley, you have um, one or two minutes uh, left. Uh, would you like to summarize uh, for us um, anything that um, uh, you would like for the search committee to remember? And so you should have a one minute elevator speech uh, ready. And so my summary is something like this. Of course, I'd have it memorized if this were officially a, a search committee meeting. As I establish my own independent laboratory, hopefully here at the Gladstone, uh, I would like to contribute to elucidating uh, the mechanisms whereby APOE4 causes neuropathology. First of all, now I'm going to just highlight those aims again so they're in your mind. Maybe I didn't get to the third one, so I want to say something about it. First, exploring the use of small molecule APOE4 structure correctors in preventing the detrimental effects of E4. Second, by characterizing the APOE4 fragments, because that's really critical to advance my work. And third, determine how and where those fragments interact with mitochondria uh, causing the dysfunction. And I want to uh, apply those observations to studying Alzheimer's disease and ultimately traumatic brain injury. So that's my one minute uh, elevator uh, summary. So you should have a summary um, and you should end with your summary. You shouldn't just stop wherever you are. You, you should um, and you can always take another minute. Nobody's going to get bent out of shape. But it's got to be a real minute and not five. Five's too long. Minute's okay. I did what I did in one minute. That's okay. It worked. I hope. I hope I get the job. Well, thank you. Good luck. And I hope you get the job. Actually, I want a job too. Okay? Bye-bye. <laughs>